Hello and welcome to the London Fanshawe 2015 Candidates Debate, the local focus on the federal election. My name is Jess Brady and I will be your moderator for today's program. We have four candidates who have joined us today to take part in our debate, but before we meet them, let's learn a little bit more about the riding they hope to represent in Ottawa. London Fanshawe is the city's largest riding at just over 101 square kilometres. The backwards L-shaped riding stretches east from Highbury to the city's limits, but also cuts west to include some of southwest London. There are 117,000 people living in the London Fanshawe riding, many of them classified as blue-collar workers. 54% of adults in the riding have a post-secondary education and make an average household income of $56,000 after taxes. The area is home to many of the city's large employers like Fanshawe College, General Dynamics Land Systems and 3M, and many more industries such as the Dr. Oker plant are setting up shop in the east thanks to its proximity to the 401 and the London International Airport. The feds did recently help land the biggest trade deal in Canadian history that will see General Dynamics supplying Saudi Arabia with armoured vehicles for the next 14 years. NDP MP Irene Matheson has held the riding since 2006. Rogers TV, the local focus on the federal election. Now that we've learned all about the riding of London Fanshawe, it's time to meet our candidates. Representing the New Democratic Party, incumbent MP Irene Matheson, for the Liberal Party, Khalil Ramal, for the Conservative Party, Susanna Dieleman, and for the Green Party, Matthew Peloza. Thank you so much for being here today, all of you. It's a, a pleasure to see everyone. So, just before we get rolling here, we will take a moment to explain the format of today's debate. Each candidate will have one minute to make an opening statement and introduce themselves. They will then have one minute to to answer each of the pre-recorded questions from members of the London media. Rebuttals will be allowed at my discretion and candidates will have 30 seconds to reply. Each person will also have an opportunity to make a closing statement. We want to hear what you think of this debate as we move along, so please feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter by using the hashtag RTVLocalCampaign. And if you're looking for more information about our debate series, be sure to check out our local campaign page at RogersTV.com. Information about the election itself can also be be found at Elections Canada's website at elections.ca. Now, without further ado, let's begin our debate. Our candidates drew for their response order, and Irene Matheson with the NDP, you are first, so please go ahead with your opening statement. Well, thank you, Jess, and uh, thanks to Rogers. It's truly a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with residents of London Fanshawe, and it's been my privilege to serve as your Member of Parliament. Now I'm asking you to re-elect me so I continue to work for you to deliver results that make a positive difference for our families and communities. I believe we're on the edge of positive and progressive change for Canada in this election. New Democrats led by Tom Mulcair are committed to repealing B Bill C-51, restoring retirement eligibility to age 65, giving seniors a significant raise, creating $15 a day childcare, helping small and medium businesses create jobs, reversing the Conservatives' $36 billion cut to health care, and ensuring veterans can access the benefits they were promised. And we will do this by respecting your priorities and balancing the budget. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now we go to our Liberal candidate, Khalil Ramal. Thank you, Jess. Uh, hello. I'm uh, Khalil Ramal, Liberal candidate for London Fanshawe. I had the privilege and honor to serve this riding for eight years. I helped uh, as an MPP, of course, uh, I helped many people in many different ways. I played a key role in creating jobs through investment like Dr. Otker, Hanwa, Rajon Kakeri, investment in the Salvation Army, the Italian Senior Project, BMO Center, the Chief Site Optimist, the Water Project for Southwestern Ontario, just to name a few. My work with Fanshawe College helped create modern institution that prepares students for 21st century's job. We, the Liberals, are the only party that actually has a, uh, has a plan to get the economy going and bring people back to work. I decided to run again because I care about this riding. I want to help people. That's why I'm in politics. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our dialogue. Thank you very much. Now we go to Susanna Dieleman and the Conservative Party. This election is about the economy and our country's security. And who is the best leader to handle these issues for you and your family? Over the last two elections, our Conservative government has guided Canada through the worst economic, global economic recession since the 1930s. We have cut taxes over 200 times for families, seniors and businesses. We have balanced the budget by eliminating wasteful spending and without cutting transfers to persons or to other levels of government. 
As a result, Canada has one of, the, one of the strongest job creation records and the strongest growth record in the G7. But Canada is not immune to global economic uncertainty from places like Europe and China. In these challenging economic times, we cannot afford the high tax, high debt policies proposed by the opposition parties. We need Prime Minister Stephen Harper with the proven experience to lead a $1.9 trillion economy. Thank you very much. We now go to Matthew Pelosa and the Green Party. There is a sickness in Ottawa. Stephen Harper and his Conservatives, though, are not the illness. They are just another symptom. Hyperpartisanship, where your opponent can never be right and never have a good idea, has led us astray of the Canadian values we all cherish, of respect, cooperation, and commitment to a common good. Power in Ottawa has become more centralized, and the current PMO has been exposed in the Duffy scandal to be overly controlling and at times corrupt. Members of Parliament have not been allowed to represent the people that put them there and have been relegated to customer service representatives for the parties they serve. Many voters believe that a vote here in London represents a vote for Stephen Harper, Thomas Mulcair, or Elizabeth May. It does not. It is for one of us. Between whip votes, closed debates, and the killing of bills by an unaccountable Senate, your Parliament has not worked for you. Today, let's turn the clock back to when being a local MP meant that you ran on your own values, ideas, and principles. I challenge my opponents here to put aside their carefully crafted notes. Let's talk about London Fanshawe and what we think the future of the country and our community should look like. I am Matthew Pelosa, and I am the Green Party candidate for London Fanshawe. Thank you very much. Now we move on to our first question of the debate, and it has to do with the economy. Uh, it's no secret that Canada and indeed the rest of the world is right now moving through some choppy economic waters. Make your pitch for why your party is the best to steer us through these tough times. And the first response will come from Khalil Ramal and the Liberals. Um, no doubt about it. The economy is uh, the most important things right now. I notice that and I feel it every single time I knock on doors. Uh, people worried, people concerned. As all of us heard this morning, uh, yeah, we're in officially in recession. Uh, our economy is suffering a lot. So the most important things, uh, we have a plan as a Liberal Party to reinvest in the economy, to invest in infrastructure, which I think will stimulate the economy. We tried it before, and then we witnessed a lot of uh, stimulation to the economy. We noticed that the economy re rebound, and then I believe we are the Liberal Party. We're the only party in Canada have a plan. We have a strategy. I think strategy will work. Uh, by investing in the middle class family because we believe strongly the middle class family uh, is the heart of our economy. Reinvesting in our infrastructure, reinvesting in our road, hospital will, will rebound the economy and will put us you know, back in the right track. Excellent. Okay, so now to Susanna Dieleman and uh, our Conservative Party representative. Forbes recently ranked Canada as the best country in the G20 in which to do business and the International Monetary Fund continues to predict growth for Canada this fiscal year. Canada has one of the strongest job creation records in the G7. Strong fiscal management is the cornerstone of the Conservative Party's economic policy, and under Stephen Harper's leadership, Canada's economy has grown and prospered far beyond most of our trading partners around the world. We've seen right here in Ontario what happened with an NDP in government. We cannot afford the opposition's high tax plans. Thank you very much. We go now to Matthew Pelosa with the Greens. You'll hear from a lot of opponents today. They'll cherry pick financial information from the past to be able to portray a good story about what's happened under their watch. Well, not all this news is good. As news came out recently, we are currently in a recession and going through troubled waters ahead. In order to move ahead successfully in the future, we need to really focus on and get advice from the experts out there. The Green Party, I believe, is the one party out there that is not going to pander to voters um, weaknesses or voters uh, to what the vo voters I'm not going to pander to um, ideas out there in the attempt to to win votes with with ideas that are not sound and tested the Green Party has a strong platform and strong policy that will bring stability to Canada for now and for the long-standing future ahead thank you thank you very much we go to Irene Matheson with the NDP Thank you very much, Jess, and uh, I, I think it's absolutely essential that there be a plan to help the economy because the reality in the London area, uh, we've had real difficulty. We've had huge job loss and uh, middle and working class families are suffering. They need to thrive and our plan is to kickstart the economy by making sure that small and medium businesses are able to create and retain jobs. We're going to reduce the small and medium business tax from 11% to 9%. We're going to introduce a 20-year infrastructure plan that, that 
our uh, municipalities can count on. It's not uh, ad hoc. It's 20 years. We'll use the existing da gas tax in order to finance it. We have a child care plan, $15 a day to get families back to work. And we'll do this we'll f with a fully costed platform and a balanced budget. Excellent. Okay. Our next question now, we go to Craig Needles from AM980. One of the themes we've been hearing throughout this campaign is the rising costs of raising a family. What is your party going to do to address that to make that more affordable for Canadians? And our first response will come from Susanna Dieleman from the Conservative Party. Families are our country's most important institution. I have four kids. I know the challenges faced as a single mom in raising those four kids and making sure that they have all that they need. If we don't have strong families, nothing else matters. The Prime Minister understands the importance of families and has provided a number of tax cuts to support families, such as the family tax cut, the tax-free savings account limit, limit uh, raising the limit on the tax-free savings account, and um, the universal child care benefit. Many of these tax cuts, such as the family tax cut and the universal child care benefit, are targeted by the opposition to be taken away from the families. Okay, thank you for your reply. Matthew Peloza. The Green Party, if nothing else, is committed to, to long-term vision. And that vision includes making sure that we have sustainable economies and environments for our families for the future. One of the ways that the Green Party hopes to achieve to have sustainability in the future within our households is to be able to guarantee uh, a, a minimum uh, livable income for Canadians. What this is is a program that means that no Canadian will left be, be left behind and be forced to live below the poverty level. It will ensure that Canadians can all work towards making a better life for them and their families. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Irene Matheson for your thoughts on that. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's true that families are struggling. And so New Democrats have been very clear that we will maintain the child tax benefit. It's important for uh, lower and middle income families. We'll make sure there is $15 a day child care. We need solid and uh, reliable child care so families can get back to work. In terms of our seniors and working families, we're going to introduce PharmaCare. The Canadian Medical Association has been very clear that that is a, a savings. It's going to help uh, not just the provinces, but it's going to have, help individual families. We're going to have home care and make sure that our seniors can stay in their homes as long as they are able. And we're going to make sure that our veterans have the uh, pensions and the benefits that they've earned. One thing I think people need to remember is that um, when they talk about tax cuts, what they really mean are fewer services, and that is at the expense of families. Okay, Khalil Ramal and the Liberals. Oh, thank you very much. We have a very uh, a comprehensive plan to support middle class family, and our platform is clear. We cannot support families with, uh, with kids and uh, up to $544 per child depends on the income, because we believe the middle class family is so important to us in order to energize the economy. So unlike the, you know, uh, the conservative, they have a universal uh, uh, you know, tax benefit or child benefit that's taxable and goes to everyone, rich, poor, everyone equally, they get the same amount of money. So in our plan, focus on the middle class, which goes from 200,000 until zero, uh, zero income, in order to uh, support those family depends on the income. But we believe strongly, we are supporting the middle class family, we're supporting the economy, because the middle class is the heart of our economy. And then, uh, as being mentioned, we are in a recession. The, the middle class put under a, a lot of stress. We want to give them some relief, some kind of support, in order to give them the you know, uh, ability to sustain themselves and sustain their families. Thank you very much. Our next question now is from Asala Eladel. She's a representative with the London Youth Advisory Council. According to Statistics Canada, the current unemployment rate among students aged 17 to 24 has been virtually stagnant since July 2014. How would you tackle unemployment and underemployment among young adults? And Matthew Peloza will answer that question first. Well, first and foremost, in order to try to get employment growth, particularly amongst youth, is we have to focus on getting the right jobs here in Canada. One of the things that you've seen over the last uh, many years under, under the Harper regime is we've seen a traditional or a ongoing growth of our part-time and underemployment type job opportunities. Uh, if we want to be able to create job opportunities for our youth, we need to make sure that we have growth in the fields in which they're excelling at, in particular high-tech um, fields, uh, which we have a lot of growth of right now in London, actually. And that's, that's really where we need to focus on our investment and focus on our education and make sure that we have educational institutions that are well-financed and well-funded to make sure that our youth are well-prepared to walk into a 21st century economy. Okay, 
Irene Matheson, your reply. Well, thank you very much. Um, and of course, um, it, it is profoundly concerning that we have uh, energetic and, uh, and um, incredible uh, youth who want to make a contribution. And so we're back to creating jobs or creating the environment where good jobs are available. And uh, first and foremost, uh, it's small and medium businesses. They create 80% of all new jobs. And we're going to make sure that they're able to make that contribution by reducing their tax rate from 11 to 9% right now, not two years from now, uh, as was promised in the recent budget. And we're going to invest in, in technologies. We've got Fanshawe College right here in London, and they have an innovation center that is reaching out to business to help them develop new products. And it has the advantage of increasing our exports and providing job experience for students. And I think it would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that uh, we are very concerned about student debt, and we're looking at relief. Thank you very much. Khalil Vamal. Well, it's a very important topic. You know, we see a lot of youth, educated people, a graduate from the University of Western Ontario, from French College, not able to find a job. Because so many different factories and companies just gone from London. Uh, like, uh, you know, Locomotive, uh, Accred almost closed, uh, Ford Company, and many, many, many outlets packed and left uh, this, uh, this riding, and especially London, Ontario. So that's what we need. We need a comprehensive plan in order to attract those people back to, to London. So we need uh, an, a member of parliament uh, has a leadership, has experience uh, uh, to persuade those companies to come back to this uh, riding. This is what I did in the past, like Dr. Atkar, Hanwa, original Kekri, all this company. I worked very hard with my party back then, with the city of London, in order to persuade them to come here, give them the chance to open. Like the NDP government, if they form a government, they cannot put a lot of taxes on, the, on those uh, companies, 5% uh, you know, corporate tax. They cannot scare company and cannot you know, force them to leave this uh, area and go away. We live in a challenging era. We have to be competitive. And we'll leave it at that. Any res replies to that? Anyone want to say anything to it? Yeah, it's very yeah. important that we remember that corporations benefit from the education, uh, the skilled uh, people in this community, and it's time that they paid their fair share. They pay less than the average in the G7 countries, uh, and uh, it's important that they pay their share and help our communities to grow. We need uh, health care, we need education, we need the things that make communities strong. And by saying to corporations, no, uh, um, you, can, you can come, you can be the uh, carpetbaggers and not have to be responsible is unacceptable. And I should mention that I erred there when I made that a little bit too broad. It was because, Irene, that you were mentioned specifically that I opened it up to a rebuttal. So thank you for that, and my apologies for any confusion that may have caused. Susanna, I do believe that it is now your turn to answer that question. Thank you. I read recently that London's workforce is growing, both in our youth and in the older um, population. But at the same time, the unemployment rate is continuing to decrease. That tells me that people are finding jobs and they're finding them right here at home. As the Conservative government continues to support the youth in our communities, we've provided a number of tax credits or enhanced tax credits that were already in existence so that while they go to school and they learn their, job on the, uh, on, learn their trade on the job, they can receive additional tax credits. At the same time, we're providing supports to those businesses who hire those students and those young people so that as they help them obtain their apprenticeships, they are able to obtain tax credits as well. These strong measures are job creators, uh, for job creators, and support our businesses across the region. These are initiatives that the opposition voted against while in Parliament. Thank you very much. Our next question now comes from Andrew Lawton of AM980. With a lot of Canadians very unhappy about the state of affairs in the Senate and several democracy-related uh, criminal charges levied against people involved in politics in recent years, do you feel Canadian democracy is working? If not, what changes do you think are necessary so that Canadians can be more assured of their government working for them? And our first reply will come from Irene Matheson. Thank you. Uh, very important question. We've seen our democracy eroded uh, by this government and by previous governments because it's top down. Uh, we see the uh, Prime Minister's office dictating to members of Parliament and uh, insisting that uh, they vote the way the Prime Minister's office wants them to vote. We would introduce a proportional representation system. That's part of our party policy. And that means that every vote will count, every single vote will matter, and we'll have a diversity in terms of our House of Commons, and we'll have the ability to make sure that that, that House reflects 
the population across the country so that ideas and energy are there. And, uh, and finally, uh, make sure that those voices are respected. We haven't had any respect for uh, parliamentarians by this Prime Minister, and I think, quite frankly, Canadians are tired of it. Okay, and now we will go to Khalil Ramal. It's a very, very important uh, issue. Many people came from around the planet to, uh, to Canada to enjoy the democratic uh, process, to enjoy the freedom in this nation. But lately, as uh, being well known, uh, the whole system being shifted for the last nine years from a democratic uh, state to uh, a police state to uh, a nation that does not respect their elected officials. Uh, ministers cannot speak uh, or dictated by the prime minister's office. And we saw the scandal after the scandal. So people, I think, looking for real change. I think we have, a, as a liberal party, we propose a real change to reform. Uh, you know, the parliament, the Senate, to have uh, the Senate and the parliament working for the people, not the people working for the Senate and the parliament. So we have to reverse. We have to create a democracy that can work for everyone. And then we had it before. So many people, as I mentioned at the beginning, enjoy that democracy. Now we don't see it, see it disappearing due to the system we have right now. Okay, thank you very much. Susanna D. Lemon. I support the current system as do most voters each time they've had a chance to vote on it in several provincial referendums. However, our party believes that the Senate needs to be significantly reformed, including term limits and elected senators. The Supreme Court has ruled on this, saying these changes would have to meet the constitutional formula of a majority of the provin provinces with a majority of the population. The provinces have all voiced different opinions to date, so we've asked them to start working towards building a consensus on this important topic. What the opposition parties are proposing is either promising things they can't deliver or delivering something that doesn't address the problem. Okay, and before we move on to Matthew, Khalil, you wanted to, yes, uh, you've course, got 30 uh, seconds. All Canadian, all voters across Canada remember when uh, the Conservative government got elected, they promised they want to have elected senators. What happened? They appointed senators to their friends and families, the people who served their interests. So that's what we're looking for. So we heard this promise before, and they had the chance for nine years to reform the Senate, never did, and look what happened, Duffy, Whalen, and many others. Okay, and Susanna, do you want to reply to that, or do you want us to move on for Matthew's response? Again, we've introduced legislation several times to, in an attempt to change the uh, Senate and the structure of the Senate. It has gone to the Supreme Court for a ruling, and they have required that the provinces build a consensus on this. Um, to meet the constitutional requirements of a majority of the provinces with a majority of the population. Okay, and with that, we move on to Matthew Peloza. Well, introducing legislation that is clearly not constitutional is clearly not actually making change. Our current system, though, is clearly broken. When 37% of the electorate can elect one party and put them in a majority who get to then rule with 100% power, that is not a good representation of what or how our democratic system should work. The Green Party would come in and would definitely insist on, on building a proportional representation system, one that allows every single vote to count and every single vote to matter. In addition to that, the Green Party is the only party that's up here today that, that has within our policy, within our platform, that we do not whip the votes. We have a lot of very talented MPs in our House of Commons right now that are not allowed to do the jobs that their local electorates have sent them to Ottawa to do. That is where I, where I think we need to have big changes. A, we need to change the system in which we elect people, and second of all, we need to let the MPs perform to their, to their abilities. Thank you. Okay, our next question now is from Pat Maloney of the London Free Press. Is Stephen Harper's oft-repeated reference to the looming terror threat facing Canadians unreasonable, or do you think there is indeed a threat facing Canadians and Londoners? And we will go to Khalil Ramal for our first reply. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, security is very important to us, and all of us as uh, Canadian, as citizens of London, uh, citizens of this beautiful nation, uh, we have a, a civil duty, we have a responsibility to make sure, uh, you know, uh, those incidents will never happen in our, our nation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, the government, uh, uh, Mr. Harper and his uh, party, you know, uh, sending uh, uh, what he called scary message to people about uh, terrorist activities might happen here and there. But, you know, the most important things, I guess, trying to uh, uh, hide all these uh, issues uh, you know, and, and uh, because they have a, like a, you know, scandals coming up, a uh, scandal came, and people talking about it, and economies in bad, bad shape. So it's trying to scare people, like fear mongering for, you know, am among us in, in this uh, nation. So in the end, security is important to us as a liberal party. 
we support any measure to protect our country. In the meantime, we have to respect our civil liberty and we have to make sure our civil liberty And with that, we will go to Susanna Dieleman. Our government and our military are working to keep us safe from people around the world who have called out Canada as a target. The Prime Minister is leading this file as his most important job and working to keep us here, keep us safe here and around the world. ISIS is publicly calling for attacks on Canada. The terrorist who attacked in Ottawa, killing Corporal Nathan Cirillo, was responding to one of those calls. There were four youth right here in London who were enticed away from home to commit acts of terror in other countries in the world. This is terrorism. And I don't understand how Thomas Mulcair doesn't even recognize this or call this terrorism. Okay, thank you very much. Would you like to say anything to that, Irene, or? Uh, yes, um, uh, I think it's very clear that um, the safety and security of Canadians is absolutely paramount with everyone. And, uh, and to uh, say that um, New Democrats don't care is um, uh, ludicrous. We already have the laws in place that secure people. We don't need Bill C-51. It infringes on rights and freedoms. Uh, we will repeal it because it's a dangerous law. Okay, and with that, we will go to Matthew Peloza for your take on this question. ISIS is very real, and the things that ISIS do are, are very um, things that you would wish didn't happen in the world. Reality is, though, is that there are several things in this world that are far more dangerous in our daily lives. Um, and focusing in on the, the fear-mongering and the, the, the warnings of, of what ISIS can do here in our communities, well, that's playing off of fear, and that is not a healthy way to, to build a community. Um, I believe that you know if, if we really are concerned about the safety and the well-being of our community, we'd be focusing a lot more th on things like our environment. Um, there's far more people that get sick every year from poor air quality than we will ever have experienced terrorism in our community. And that really is one of the things where our focus should be on. Okay. Now, I know, Irene, you had a chance to reply specifically to Susanna's statement, but uh, obviously you have, you have, this is your chance to reply to the question that was given. Okay, uh, and uh, certainly um, I think it's important that we work with the United Nations. It's the um, uh, best way to keep this country secure. As I said, we have uh, existing laws that are working very, very well in regard to public safety. Uh, the loss of our rights and freedoms is absolutely unacceptable. This government has thrown out the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have internet snooping. We have a government that has the ability to ask police forces to arrest people without warrants and uh, keep them in jail without ever telling them what they're charged with. And ironically, of course, uh, the Liberals voted for Bill C-51 before it was even written, before they saw the text of the bill. Not acceptable. As I said, um, it's a regressive and... Uh, and uh, re um, uh, unacceptable bill, we will repeal Bill C-51. Okay, and I know that uh, Khalil Ramal, you wanted to make a note on that. Well, I mean, uh, you know, just uh, you and I and our family, when they want to go on the plane, want to make sure it's safe. Want to go watch a hockey game, we want to make sure it's safe. In the meantime, also, we want to make sure that our civil liberty being protected. So we're the only party, and like the NDP, went to the far end, they don't do nothing, and the conservative, they want to change the state to a police state. Want to have a balanced approach, when we get elected, we're going to amend the bill, we're going to make it fair and balanced between the security and uh, civil liberty. Okay, so I think we're going to move on now to our next question, as everyone seems to have had a chance to sound off on this one. This question comes from Craig Needles from AM 980. Discussions about marijuana surrounding this campaign have been very prevalent as well. Decriminalization, legalization, leave things the way they are. Where does your party stand on the marijuana issue? And this first question, or rather first reply, comes from Susanna. The Prime Minister has been very clear on this. We don't want drugs on our streets, in our playgrounds, or available to our children. Studies have shown the negative effects that drugs, including marijuana, have on a developing mind. With four teenagers of my own, I can't even imagine a parent agreeing with Justin on the legalization of marijuana. Okay, and Matthew? Well, I look at the legalization of marijuana as a very simple answer. It's something that should happen. Uh, Marijuana is no worse than alcohol, which has been legal for decades in Canada. Um, by, by making marijuana legal, you can do several positive things in your community with that. First of all, you can ensure that any that is out there is safe, 
and regulated so that you take dangers out of the street because who knows what's actually in the things that are on the street. Second of all, you're removing the funding from organized crime within this country and allowing that revenue instead of going to organized crime, to, crime to, to going to the government coffers where we can then divert that revenue to things that make a big positive impact in our, in our economy. Um, so looking at that, to me, it's a logical choice, legalization and making something that you do in the privacy of your own home, which normally conservatives aren't talking about or don't want to intrude on. I don't understand why they want to be intrusive on this issue. Okay, well then we will go right to Irene Matheson for your thoughts on this question. Yeah, certainly uh, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, they, they all are uh, substances and we have to be intelligent about them. But reverting back to the 1950s and hysteria about reefer madness isn't going to do it. Um, New Democrats want to decriminalize uh, marijuana because uh, we don't want to see people's lives ruined uh, by a criminal charge for simple possession. Uh, we also uh, want to make sure that police forces are doing what they should be doing and looking after public safety, not chasing after kids. Now, it's interesting, the Liberals talk about uh, legalization, but that requires a plan. It would take years, it requires uh, consultation with the provinces, and like alcohol and tobacco, there are issues around taxes, production, uh, point of sale, regulations, licensing, all of this takes a great deal of time and a lot of discussion, and so when the Liberals talk about legalization, I think it's, um, pardon me, smoke and mirrors. Oh, and on that note, we will go to Khalil Ramal. Thank you very much. I think it's a very important topic. Many people ask about it, as been mentioned. Uh, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, its substance being used in the street. So I think uh, uh, you know, any elected government should uh, create a safety measure uh, to protect uh, you know, their citizen. I think uh, leave it as it is without any uh, uh, you know, uh, organizational stuff or any legalizations. It's going to harm many people on the street. So um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, I don't know how it's gonna be looking like the, the, the legislations in order to legalize marijuana, but the first and foremost, I'm with the safety of the people. I'm uh, looking forward to see something uh, under control, uh, better than being out of control. Uh, I think it's our obligation as a government uh, to uh, make sure all the people who live in this nation safe and uh, uh, working according to rules and laws in this nation. Okay, so our next question comes from Sean Meyer of Our London. How has your party supported the development of alternative energy solutions for Canada? And our first respondent will be Matthew Peloza. I feel that one was served up to me. <laughs> um, obviously the Green Party is going to be more pro-green energy than anyone else up here. Uh, we believe it is essential that we move to a, a, a non-carbon based economy in this country. The Green Party is going to be supportive of initiatives that will allow us to move towards more wind, more solar um, energy solutions that allow us to take carbon out of our system. Um, with that as well, what the Green Party really highly promotes as well is the retrofits of all of our existing infrastructure. Uh, actually the best invested dollar that you can have in making our economy um, and our environment better is to spend the money on fixing current buildings. Um, you're going to create more jobs that way and you're going to create an, an economy or an environment where our electric, electrical use is significantly decreased and we don't need to spend billions of dollars on new power plants. Okay, now to Irene Matheson of the NDP. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, certainly uh, Canada has some real problems in regard to greenhouse gases. We've seen those gas uh, emissions increase significantly under the Liberals and the Conservatives have been remiss at best in terms of uh, dealing with climate change. So we're talking about sustainable, environmentally responsible energy, and that is, of course, solar, geothermal, uh, wind. We would also have conservation programs in place because, as has been pointed out, they do create jobs. The world is desperate uh, for new technology and uh, energy sustainability, and Canada is not even in the game. So we need absolutely to invest in the kinds of energy future that is going to sustain the planet and, uh, and keep good jobs here at home. Uh, finally, I would say that um, we do have to um, uh, do this gradually. We can't just do it all at once. So there has to be intelligent planning. Okay, Khalil Ramal. Yes, I'm a big supporter of green energy and uh, alternative uh, energy. And um, I, I came, you know, from uh, provincial government who are, uh, I think, was the leading uh, government in Canada in terms of green energy. Uh, we create that, uh, what do you call it, the green uh, culture in, in, in Ontario. Look, those uh, solar panels everywhere in the, 
uh, in, in, in Ontario, uh, the windmills, and uh, we closed the coal, coal generations. And uh, now we have zero emission comes from the coal generations. And we see hundreds of uh, uh, wind turbine, uh, you know, uh, uh, producing energy in this province. As a matter of fact, I work with a solar company right now. I'm a big fan of alternative energy, green energy. And I believe Ontario, the leading province in Canada, in North America, in terms of green energy. Uh, look at the Niagara Falls. Uh, back then when, I was in when we were in government in Ontario, we upgraded the system from 1,000 megawatt to 2,000 megawatt. We have many uh, solar farms across this province to produce energy. Now, I think we are the leader, and I don't see why I'm not supporting this initiative again. Okay, Irene, were you st signaling to me that you would like to say something? I think you uh, were. Yes, um, <laughs> I, uh, I am reminded that it was a liberal government in this province uh, and a conservative government before it that has signaled the uh, privatization of our renewable resources. And in this case, the wind government is planning to sell off 60% of Hydro One. That is clean and renewable energy. Uh, we cannot afford to allow that to go into the hands of those who want to profit from it instead of looking after our economy. Uh, hydro at cost, that's the promise to business. And, and from there, we will go right back to Khalil Ramal. <laughs> I mean, it's important to like, uh, you know, to have ideas on talk, but the most important thing is how you act. I guess, uh, personally, I act, I support those companies, I work with them on a regular basis, still now, as I mentioned, with a solar, uh, solar uh, company, and I believe it's uh, very essential for our economy, create the jobs, and also protect our environment. So I don't care much about talk, I want to act. Okay, and on that, we will move over to Susanna Dieleman for your response. Our Conservative government has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in initiatives to keep our air clean, our water clean, and our land clean. Many of these initiatives are for alternative green energy sources, such as wind towers and solar farms. What I'm hearing as I knock on doors around London Fanshawe is that people want a balanced approach on both the environment and protecting the economy and jobs, and the opposition parties don't seem to understand that. Instead, the opposition plans to impose a carbon tax on absolutely everything, raising prices from fuel to groceries that will kill jobs and put businesses in this riding at risk. I see a, a shaking of a head there, Irene. Do you well, it's, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, we have a prime minister who used to be a, a climate change denier, but now even the conservatives are coming to realize that uh, we can't keep spewing out uh, harbor hydrocarbons uh, without some kind of, uh, of um, restraint. And uh, even the conservatives are talking about how do we deal with carbon and carbon tax. Okay, so we're going on to our next question from Devin Peacock of AM980. If your party forms the next government, what will you do to help improve the lives of Canadian women? And the first person to reply to this will be Irene Matheson. Thank you. Um, yes, one of the uh, most significant things in terms of, uh, of women is their vulnerability uh, and uh, the need for financial security. So uh, we would make sure that they were safe, that they had access to affordable childcare uh, and uh, affordable housing. It would mean that women could escape violence. It would mean that uh, women could be independent in terms of looking after their families, looking after themselves. It's very, very important for us to remember all Canadian women, and that includes the 1,200 missing and murdered Aboriginal women. We would um, make sure that there was an inquiry so that the reality of the violence that they face is uh, something that Canadians understand and that there are solutions. First Nations have solutions. Women have solutions. And uh, we would make very, very sure that they had the opportunity to not only exercise those solutions, but to be secure in their homes, free from violence, and uh, have access to jobs, training, childcare. Thank you very much, Khalil Ramal. It's very important. Women, you know, my mother, my wife, my uh, sister, my daughter. So, you know, it's, uh, as a government, we have an obligation to protect all the human beings uh, in, in, in the society. I think women being subject to abuse in the society for many, many years, I think we, they deserve all the attention and all the support. Uh, personally, when I was uh, in the provincial government, I was a part of the caucus women uh, because I, the women in general bring good ideas to the table and uh, 
uh, they have a more uh, sensibilities to the different issues. And uh, that's why I joined the, the caucus and support them uh, all the way. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering, like uh, Irene and uh, the candidate, uh, the, the Democratic Party, declining from the, you know, the debate about women issues in, in in this country. And then in the meantime, they come and talk about women issues. So if you, the NDP and uh, you know the conservative, care about women, why don't participate in the debate and talk about the main issues facing the women in this nation? Okay. And on that note. Uh, yes, uh, our leader has been very clear that he will uh, attend every debate that uh, the Prime Minister is present at. And so I think it's uh, uh, very important that uh, we be clear. I was the chair of the Committee for the Status of Women, and for five years I advocated for women. I put their issues first and foremost. Um, I did the real work on the ground. And again, we're right back to affordable housing, uh, child care, the need for women to be able to uh, secure their own future. And uh, I've been there. Thank you very much. To Susanna now. We have provided millions in funding to prevent violence against women and to um, support women's health initiatives. For our lowest income seniors, many of whom are widows, we made the largest increase to the guaranteed income supplement in the last 25 years. We're also working hard to protect the economy, jobs, and to support families, all of which are just as important to women as they are to men. Opposition plans to raise taxes will send the Canadian economy into chaos, resulting in lost jobs and closed businesses for everyone. Okay, Matthew. First, I want to say I was greatly saddened when a couple weeks ago when we had our, uh, the debate was canceled on women's issue. The fact that two men can decide that we shouldn't talk about women's issues in a debate is something that should not happen in 2015. There are other things that shouldn't happen in 2015. We shouldn't still have the pay inequality that we have between men and women that we have today. That's something that should have been addressed. Um, there are several things in which I believe my party will stand behind to make sure to try to fix those issues among, like some other people have already spoken to today, making sure we have affordable daycare as an option and available to, to all women so that they can feel that they can enter the workforce if they choose. Um, to ensure that all women feel safe and, and free in their communities and don't feel vulnerable. Um, but I think the, really the communication and the conversation needs to start with women. And I, I'm actually quite proud that my party leader is the only female uh, party leader and someone who I feel can really bring those issues forward to the table. Thank you very much. We are ready for our next question. It's from Deborah Van Brink from the London Free Press. Few people have mentioned homelessness as an issue, yet our shelters are continuously full. What one thing would you do to reduce homelessness in London? And our first... Yeah, Absolutely. The question was, uh, name one thing that you would do to reduce homelessness. Okay. And that's actually for you, Khalil. You're the first up. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's a very important topic. I think affordable home is very important to all of us in this uh, nation. And poverty should be addressed. I had the privilege and honor to meet with the uh, United Church uh, uh, group that uh, came to my office and talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, homelessness and talking about uh, shelters, talk about poverty in this nation. I think due to the recession, to the economical circumstances we're facing in this nation, we see a lot of homeless on the street, whether in London, Ontario, Toronto, anywhere across this nation. I think as a, our obligation as a nation should protect those vulnerable people among us. It's a part of our obligation as a, as a state. And uh, that's why we're focusing on the middle class family. So support middle, middle class family, put a little bit money in their hand, give them the chance to be able to provide a shelter for themselves, for their kids, and that cannot be homeless and, uh, and, and wandering on the street. So, you know, it's I think we'll go back to the main issue. Middle class family needs support because in a lot of stress, move on to the poverty. Thank you very much. Over to Susanna Dieleman. The New York Times reported that Canada now has the richest middle class in the world, surpassing even the United States. Our conservative government has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in housing and removed over one million people from tax rolls, including 380,000 seniors. We also made the largest increase to the guaranteed income supplement in the last 25 years. For most low-income people, having a good-paying job is the most important thing. Our low-tax plan will continue to support businesses and create jobs, while the opposition's high-tax, high-debt plans will kill jobs and put businesses at risk. Thanks for that. And now we go to Matthew. I'm not quite sure why an answer about middle class was, was, was given when the question was about the people that are our poorest in our society. Uh, one of the things the Green Party would, would propose is a uh, minimum guaranteed income. 
And this is something that is actually quite popular both on, on, on the left and the, the right side of the political spectrum. Uh, it means that every single person in this country will be given a minimal, sustainable amount of income in which they can have uh, a standard of a living. Um, I highly recommend everyone look at it. It is something that we all should be talking about. Um, obviously homelessness and the poverty issues we have in this country are big issues. It's a step in the right direction, but it's something that we should be talking about. Um, I also want to state that I am rather appalled at the um, lack of the government action to deal with Aboriginal homeless, which is absolutely at astounding rates, um, and just as a representation of this government's inability to deal with Aboriginal issues. Okay, and over to Irene Matheson. Well, thank you. Um, it's uh, a reality in this country, an incredible country, uh, with uh, riches and uh, security that we have more than a million homeless people, and that includes family with children. We need permanent support uh, for those families, uh, not the short-term and precarious stuff that we've seen from Liberal and Conservative governments. Uh, we would bring back the national housing strategy that was defunded by Conservatives under Brian Mulroney and cancelled entirely in 1993 by the Liberals. CMHC uh, has fiscal ability to invest in, uh, in that strategy and we would bring back the kind of um, housing policy that means families have a secure place to live. You can't organize your life, you can't look for a job, you can't take uh, care of your kids the way you want to if you don't have a proper home. And that's what we would uh, make sure was available for all Canadians. Okay, and now we are moving on to our final question, and it comes from Andrew Lawton of AM980. A lot of party leaders have proposals for the country that might not necessarily jive with your constituents. If you have a disagreement with your party or your party leader, are you prepared to represent what you feel is best for your constituents instead of what your party loyalty might dictate? Okay, and our first respondent will be Susanna. That's a good question and a very challenging one. In areas where there is a debate between party lines and the public will for the London Fanshawe riding, one, I would have to look at the legislation to see what, it's, what is being proposed. I would also want to consult with the people of London Fanshawe on a more uh, individual basis to find out where their positions are and, and then to make a decision from there. Okay, thank you very much. Matthew. That, that's a very simple answer for someone who's representing the Green Party. We are the only party up here who insists on having policy that we do not whip our votes within, within the party. I can't say the same for the other three people sitting beside me here. Uh, in fact, the NDP has had the most whipped votes of, of any party in the House of Commons, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, no? Well, I'd love to see the stats that show me differently. But, um, but the Green Party is the one party that will allow MPs to represent um, both their, their constituents um, and, to, and to represent as well their, their own beliefs and their values as well to, to ensure that, that we're always having the best ideas brought forward and, and the best democratic uh, system possible to ensure that we're, we're, we're reaching common de democratic goods. Now, I think it's a good thing we're going to Irene next for this question, which I will just remind everyone is, you know, where, where do your loyalties lie in terms of voting your conscience? Do you toe the party line or do you represent your constituents or your own personal views? Irene. Uh, I represent my constituents. <clears throat> it's very important that they have a voice in Ottawa. And in terms of policy, uh, the policy of the New Democratic Party comes from the grassroots up. It is people policy, and I am very, very proud of it. I have uh, pledged to support policy that means that families uh, are supported, that seniors are respected, and that veterans have the, um, the pensions that they deserve. These are all important. If there are concerns, uh, we talk about it in caucus, I can speak directly to my leader. I can speak directly to him without any kind of fear of being demoted or um, treated badly, uh, as we've seen with uh, other prime ministers. So um, we, um, in, uh, in the NDP, um, we have this ability to talk things through and come to a, a solution that is workable. And in terms of my constituents, I will always respect their wishes and their needs. Okay, and to Khalil Amal. Important topic. I guess uh, I have a record in this regard. I always uh, believe I represent the people of London Fanshawe, which I did. I uh, always uh, went back to them and asked them what they think may different issues through town hall meeting, and I uh, <coughs> built my uh, direction from there. So I believe it's a Liberal Party. It's a, uh, uh, 
a party is a, with a big tent uh, hold many different views and I promise uh, before and I will promise again I will uh, you know uh, be a great supporter of London Fancha and uh, represent them well uh, well and uh, uh, I wouldn't go against their wishes if there's any issue uh, don't understand it or some kind of confusion about it I'm more than happy to explain it to them and I will uh, basically in the end uh, if I get elected, I'll be working for the people of London Fanshawe, not they're working for me. They're not working for me, I'm working for them. Okay, well that brings to a close our debate portion of the program. Now we have a chance for our candidates to provide you with their closing statements. So that uh, each person will have a minute and a half to sum up their best uh, pitch for why they should be the representative for London Fanshawe. And uh, we will go in reverse order from our opening statements. So we will start with Matthew Peloza. Oh. The one thing that has been loud and clear time and time again as we've listened to people and their struggles with dealing with the government that's been in power for the last four and a half years is how much people want change. They want a government that's responsive. They want a government that will listen to them. I believe the Green Party is the best choice to have that government. The Green Party will be responsive to listening to democratic uh, will of the people and it will allow MPs to truly represent you in the House of Commons. Um, I ask that everyone here have an open mind go check out all the literature uh, choose for yourself which party aligns with the values best and that you vote for the party that you think will really bring you change in the next election so please on october 19th please ensure you vote and please consider voting for myself matthew peloza for the green party of canada thank you thank you very much susanna dieleman this election is about the economy and selecting a leader on one hand you have the strong proven leadership of prime minister stephen harper with a low tax plan to support families and seniors and to create jobs. On the other hand, we have opposition leaders with high tax, high debt plans that will undermine our economy, destroy jobs, and leave you with less money in your pocket. The stakes are high and we have a choice. On October 19th, I ask for your vote. Thank you. And Khalil Ramal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Rogers for hosting us today. I want to thank all the viewers, uh, the listeners. And uh, it's a very important election uh, in October 19th. Uh, it's about this nation, about the future of this nation. It's the, about the investment in this nation, about the infrastructure, about the democracy, reforming the Parliament Hill, reforming the Senate. It's about the people, about middle class, about investment in our nation, about the democracy, about the freedom, about civil liberty. All these elements are important to all our people in this nation. It's about security. So that's why this election is going to be very, very important for all of us. And I hope. Uh, on October 19, uh, uh, you know, the constituents of London Fanshawe choose me as a, their MP to present them and benefit from my experience, leadership and experience and determination and hard work to bring job to them and uh, as I did in the past and attract more investment to come to London as I did in the past and also I continue uh, doing even though my absence from the parliament I met many different times with the City of London with many proposals in order to attract uh, people to come to London, invest in London, open a job for Londoners, and also continue to work with uh, Fancha College, the University of Western Ontario, with Mayor of London in order to have uh, an idea, a plan to revive London again. And again, October 19, hopefully I got your vote. Thank you very much. And we go to Irene Matheson. Well, thank you very much, Jess. And again, thank you to Rogers. We really are on the brink of amazing change for Canada, and I want you to be part of it. In London, Fanshawe, we've already stopped uh, the Harper government and Stephen Harper. By re-electing me, together we can make real our goals for Canada. Infrastructure for the future, so that we can build strong communities. Reversing the $36 billion cut to health care. Taking action on climate change giving genuine care to our seniors and veterans, repealing Bill, Bill C-51, and of course, securing our uh, postal services. Door-to-door -door delivery of mail is very important to my constituents, and uh, I am determined, uh, and with New Democrats, we are determined to return door-to-door -door services for Canadians. This vote is, uh, is critical, and I encourage all people to vote. In terms of uh, our local situation, I have experience. I've helped more than 12,000 people in London Fanshawe with their income tax problems, with pension problems, and with EI. 
and I want to continue to do that. We can do that. We can in, uh, in this fabulous country. In the words of Jack Layton, don't let them tell you it can't be done. Thank you very much. And so that marks the end of our candidates debate for London Fanshawe. I would like to say a big thank you to all of our candidates who were here today. It was wonderful to see you all here, as well as all of our local journalists and members of the London Youth Advisory Council who, uh, who, who submitted questions for this. It was fantastic to get so many different inputs. Uh, just before we go, we're going to show for your own edification that profile of London Fanshawe one more time. London Fanshawe is the city's largest riding at just over 101 square kilometers. The backwards L-shaped riding stretches east from Highbury to the city's limits, but also cuts west to include some of southwest London. There are 117,000 people living in the London Fanshawe riding, many of them classified as blue-collar workers. 54% of adults in the riding have a post-secondary education and make an average household income of $56,000 after taxes. The area is home to many of the city's large employers like Fanshawe College, General Dynamics Land Systems and 3M, and many more industries such as the Dr. Oker plant are setting up shop in the east thanks to its proximity to the 401 and the London International Airport. The feds did recently help land the biggest trade deal in Canadian history that will see General Dynamics supplying Saudi Arabia with armoured vehicles for the next 14 years. NDP MP Irene Matheson has held the riding since 2006. Rogers TV, the local focus on the federal election. Now, if you're interested in watching this debate again or seeing the other debates in our series, be sure to go to our local campaign page at rogerstv.com. Also, if you're looking for information about uh, the campaign here locally, more information just about the debates that have happened, go to that website. And if you're looking for information about the election itself on October 19th, please make sure you go to Elections Canada's website, which is elections.ca. And if you want to sound off on the program that you've seen, today you want to share your thoughts please do we want to hear them we want to see what you what you thought of the program uh, you can go onto Twitter and use the hashtag RTV local campaign so that would be fantastic to see your responses to all of the great uh, replies and uh, responses from our candidates today so once again my name is Jess Brady please join us again next time as we put the local focus on the federal election